The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 When Mark and Jane arrived in Edinburgh, they discovered that Mark had left his camera on the train. At the lost and found office, he has to fill in a lost property form. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, I think I left my camera on the train from London early today. Did you, sir? Oh, well. In that case, we'd better fill in a lost property form. Can you tell me your name? Yeah, it's Mark Adams. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, your address? You mean in Britain or in the States? Uh, how long are you staying? Oh, I've still got a few months in Britain. Okay, then. Can you give me your address here? Right. It's 21, uh -huh. Thames Drive, uh -huh. Lee on C. That's L-E-I-G-H uh -huh. on C, Essex. Uh -huh. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Do you want the phone number? Uh, yes, I'd better have that. OK, uh, 0702 35211. Thanks. And you say it was a camera. What make and model? It's a Rico. Rico. How do you spell that? R-I-C-O-H. OK, got that. Now, you say it was the London train. What time did it arrive in Edinburgh? At 4.55 this afternoon. Exactly on time. Uh, well, then, if we find it, sir, shall we phone you? No, I think I'll drop in the day after tomorrow to check up. Ah, uh, right you are, sir. We'll do our best. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a flight attendant talking to passengers on an airplane. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. I hope you all slept soundly overnight. I'm pleased to confirm that our flight is running on schedule and we expect to arrive in Christchurch at 8 a.m. local time. That's about 50 minutes from now. I've been advised by our pilot to warn you that there may be some turbulence on our descent. So please remain seated and have your seatbelt on at all times. 
As you may have heard, a fairly severe tropical depression is headed for New Zealand and in fact is reaching the west coast of the South Island as we speak. Thankfully, we are landing on the east coast, where the weather is still relatively good. Wind speeds are steady at around 15 miles per hour and the sky is generally overcast, though the sun may creep out from time to time as the morning progresses. That said, when the storm reaches this afternoon, conditions will deteriorate rather quickly. Please exercise extreme caution if you're traveling anywhere on the island today. As I said, the storm has already made landfall on the west, northwest coast, and we're getting reports of high seas and very strong winds of around 75 miles per hour, with gusts up to 110 in Collingwood. Heavy and thundery rainfall is also being reported there. The Southern Alps are experiencing severe blizzard conditions, and there is a virtual whiteout on the roads. There are accumulations of up to three foot of snow already, so please, under no circumstances, be tempted to take the mountain road from Christchurch to Bluff. Use the coastal route for the entire journey if you must go down south. Over in the west, in Hokitika, and the southwest, in Milford, conditions are bad with heavy rain, high winds, and high seas. In fact, several tornadoes were reported in Hokkitika and also in Lewis, which is slightly further inland. Also inland, on the northern edge of the Southern Alps, Arthur's Pass should be avoided at all costs. Roads are closed due to the heavy snowfall. Kaikoura has reported wind speeds of 45 miles per hour, with occasional gusts a bit stronger, but so far it has escaped the heavy rain. At present, it is windy and cloudy there. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. We should be landing in approximately 10 minutes' time. Just an update for you on the weather conditions in and around Christchurch. We expect the storm to reach us by approximately 1 p.m. Town officials are closing all roads out of town as conditions are simply going to be too dangerous with the risk of falling trees and flying debris too high. Roads will have officially been closed for 30 minutes by the time we land at 8 a.m. Passengers whose travel plans did not entail an overnight stay in Christchurch, we would like to extend our apologies to you on behalf of the Christchurch Town Council for the inconvenience caused. However, it is in the interest of safety that these steps have been taken. Those of you without accommodation should go straight to our customer service desk at the airport where a council official will be waiting to take you to temporary shelters in the town. Those of you who are staying in Christchurch should go to your hotel and follow the instructions of staff there. It may yet be necessary to evacuate you down to the shelters as well. This decision will be made by hotel staff who are monitoring the situation very carefully. The storm has made a direct hit on the island. The storm I is expected to arrive in Christchurch at about 4 p.m., after which a brief period of calm will be experienced. The western wall of the storm will then hit at approximately 4.30, and the extreme winds and heavy rain should have improved by about 7 p.m. All roads will be reopened from 9 p.m. onwards. However, we're advising people to refrain from driving unless absolutely necessary, as conditions will be extremely hazardous with the risk of flooding everywhere. Flash flooding is a real danger for the valley towns of the south in particular, as mountain rivers and tributaries have already swelled to record levels. 
High winds have already caused massive power cuts in West Coast towns, and a string of major tornadoes have caused havoc across the Midlands. If at all possible, stay in Christchurch until tomorrow morning when the cleanup will begin. And above all, stay safe. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear some students talking about an art assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. What have you been working on, Arthur? I've been looking into the funding of the arts by the Arts Association. Oh, Mr. Simpson gave you that topic, did he? Yes, it's not too difficult. At least all the facts and figures are easy to find, or I think they will be. <laughs> I've done a lot of useful stuff already. Simpson hasn't asked me to present my research for the past few seminars, so I think he might ask me this time.、Hmm. Well, what have you found out? Well, it's big money at the Arts Association, three hundred and thirty million pounds from the government and one hundred and eighteen million from the lottery.、Mm -hmm. Let me see. I've got my notes here. Now. The Arts Association mission statement tells us that it exists to develop, sustain, and promote the arts.、Mm. So that's clear. But then we need to know exactly how it can do this. However, before we get to that, there are certain issues which the association must take into account. What are those issues? They are first access. This is the idea that the arts mustn't be just for the few. Not just Italian opera, but pop concerts too. Something like that. Other issues are education, cultural diversity, social regeneration, and social inclusion.、Hmm. All these are different ways of saying that the arts are for everyone. All right, but what does it actually do? It does what it wants. I think the government does not interfere in its activities, but demands that it gets value for money for its funds. But there must be certain programs that it carries out. Oh yes, there is the touring program,、mm. which is what it says. That is a program to support. Give money to. Yes, that's right. To support touring companies,、mm. for example, dance companies, orchestras, and so on. There is also the recovery program. What on earth is that?、Uh, it's a financial program to give extra money to organisations which are financially in a bad way, or which might have financial difficulties in the future.、Mm. Like it says, it's for their recovery. It all seems very complicated.、Uh, it is. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. 
Did you get any information on the reading for the other half of our work? Yes, I did. You mean the art and society module? Yes. Yes. I met Simpson himself as we were waiting for a train at Norchester Station, so I managed to ask him. Any luck? Yes. I've got the notes I took here.、Oh. He told me, of course, to start with Greenberg,、mm. who covers contemporary art and the up to the minute movements in America. It's about the modern movements, really. As far as the economic impact of art is concerned, a basic text is the parliamentary report on art and the UK economy.、Mm. This gives lots of monetary facts and figures. But the figures are not very satisfactory, as of course a lot of the information is confidential and can't be published. Art now, art well, by someone called Denison sounds exciting, and is about how art and artists are created, presented for buyers, and sold in the U.S. It's about the whole trade in art as a phenomenon, like a product, like washing powder. Yes, <laughs> that's the idea of the book, anyway. <sighs> And there's another one here. Oh yes, by someone called Hampton. It's a book called American Art, which Simpson says is full of discussion on the relationship of art to the other aspects of culture, such as film, television, books, and so on. Popular culture, I suppose. Not just popular, culture of all sorts, I imagine. Finally. For the spiritual and more abstract aspects of art, he recommends *Art and the Mind of Modern Man* by Frick.、Mm. It's sort of about how art relates to how we think. He did have lots of other recommendations, but luckily his train arrived before he could move on to them. <laughs> These seem enough to me. <laughs> yes, they're a good place to start. We will be busy. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to thirteen weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six-term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated 39 studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardized test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term.
He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So, the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So, we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.